Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wish you a warm welcome here to the Bologna and the Sahara Forest Project Pavilion today. Today, we have an exciting event about elevating gender issues into uh, climate solutions. And it's my big pleasure as a communications director of Sahara Forest Project in Jordan to wish a warm welcome to this distinguished panel. Uh, from the end there is Mr. Dan Cameron from USAID. Uh, we have Barbara Merch from uh, Pathfinder International. Uh, we have Steve Trovic from, from NURAD. Uh, we have Frederick Havide from, uh, from the Bologna Foundation. And it's a pleasure to also wish, it, uh, wish a warm welcome to, to Mrs. Celia from the UNF uh, Triple C. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I'll give the floor to Dan Cameron. Dan Cameron has been a long time friend of the Bologna Foundation and the Sahara Forest Project work. We met, uh, I think, more than 10 years ago for the first time. You've been following our work, we have been following yours. Dan is a renewable energy expert and scientist from the, from the US. He has been the lead author of the IPCC uh, Nobel Peace Prize winning report uh, from 2007. And he's done, you have been a former US science envoy and, and lots of these people in the panel speaks highly about you. So Dan, I know we have to leave soon, but please, we would love your remarks on, on the gender issue and how this can make a change in, in our common goal to fight global warming and health. <laughs> <laughs> it smells like a rock concert. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you and Bologna in particular for working on this issue for what has been a very long time. You guys saw the vision of holistic solutions to energy, water, food. And in the early days, we didn't talk enough about the gender diversity equity aspects of, of this issue. Right? And I think that for a whole variety of reasons, from the SDG 7 goals, to the Me Too movements, to the recognition that we're not gonna solve climate without addressing social, racial, and gender inequality. And we're not gonna solve those issues without solving climate. So I think that there's a much more integrated view. Um, at the US Pavilion, you've seen the announcements recently around methane and around smart agriculture. And these are really part and parcel to what you guys have had a vision, I would say before anybody, and willing to you know, make this saying holistic is easy, doing holistic is a pain in the somewhere. Um, and I think that's really the story here because we know that just green energy is already a big lift, but green energy without solutions that provide better economic opportunities, and in particular to those who are at the environmental, economic, the racial, gender fringes. And those people are hit hardest by climate change. They are already being hit hard. The IPCC report finally got around to saying that clearly in our fourth assessment report. That was the last one I was on. But I think that the more examples that are concrete like this, the Jordan Project to me is fascinating. When I was science envoy in um, the Obama administration, we were so excited to see the project plans come forward and to see the investment. And it's one of the things that Israel and Jordan got really excited about doing together because they each saw this was a win. If this COP is going to be about financing, not just promissory notes, but actual dollars, yens, RMBs, shillings, every, whatever it is in the bank, we're going to both need projects where that money could move immediately but also groups that are willing to be the guinea pigs for how do you track it. And if there's gonna be gender metrics, if there's gonna be metrics on new crops, if there's gonna be metrics on the ecological impact, this is the kind of project that can do it. And I would like to see efforts like this literally everywhere in energy rich, but people poor areas in the sense that there's obviously lots of energy that needs to be harvested, but without this kind of, of investment in the projects, we're not gonna see it. So I'm thrilled, I wish I could stay for the whole conversation. Um, but if we don't stand up these examples and track them, we're not gonna convince the industries and the countries that are a little hesitant that there is a big jobs in the clean energy future. So I'm really honored to be here. I'll stop there and listen for as long as I can. And then uh, thank you all for, for your work and thanks for you know, being persistent when no one would listen early on. Now it's time. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, and thanks for coming. Uh, we have a great partner here at the, the Pavilion today, Pathfinder International. It's been a pleasure to, to work together on, on this great program.
Barbara, you're the managing director, but before I give the word to you, I just want to quote Kofi Annan about Pathfinder. Pathfinder International is a remarkably successful organization. Its model of funding and working through local partners helps ensure the sustainability of programs. Despite all barriers, Pathfinder finds way to serve marginalized populations, including the poorest. Here, are, here is the managing director of this great organization, Barbara Merch. For is yours. Thank you, Magnus. Such a pleasure to be here today. And really a pleasure to talk about elevating the issue of gender in climate solutions. Building on what Dan just said, I think it would be impossible to get to a climate solution while forgetting half of humanity. So at Pathfinder, we have started our work in really building from the roots where we work in some of the most marginalized places around the world, throughout Africa and the Sahel and Francophone West Africa, up in South Asia with Pakistan, Bangladesh. And to your point, we're doing actual work on the ground by partnering very deeply with the people who know the context the best. Our country-led leadership is extraordinary, and I feel very grateful to be part of an organization that's not only women-led, but also country-led in understanding local solutions. And another piece of this in our women-led is that we strongly believe that the most vulnerable populations cannot begin to assess agency without basic access to contraception and education. So that's plank number one. You really have to have solid foundations. And for the funding that's available, actually, getting that to happen is the mission we need to absolutely commit to as part of a holistic solution. Second, we also want to make sure that we're getting together with voices. That means partnering across silos. And that is exciting because that will then allow us to uplift and hold the empowerment in the process of women's voices. It's a pleasure to partner with Cecilia on the Gender Equity Forum. We're a signatory. And to the work that you're doing, I'd love to hand it for a moment over to you because I'm so proud of the work you're doing. And you've also shared some great stories with your great lobbying on the side here during COP26 that I'd love to have you share. So Cecilia. Thanks. Um, in my current position, I just want to tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up in the informal settlements of Nairobi, and I got my opportunity to break through into the movement and into the development work by working side by side for the Nobel, with the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Professor Wangari Madai, and not just working with her to learn from her in her efforts to plant trees as a force to ensure that human rights uh, and the whole issues of environment and sustainability was central to really uh, reforming and transforming institutional barriers uh, towards development and socioeconomic uh, provisioning, but also to ensure that women and young girls also had a place uh, in the conversations. So I got in in terms of uh, participating in the three New York conventions, which is the climate change. This is going back to more than 30 years now when the, the Rio conference was held, desertification and biodiversity. And then having an opportunity through that process to work within the United Nations for different parts of it. And two months ago, uh, being able to get a position of the director of intergovernmental support within the UNFCC. But I just want to translate that journey for me. And that journey for me is a demonstration of how starting from the corridors and wondering why are we dealing with issues separating biodiversity and nature where I grew up in the informal settlements and my passion to study urban planning was because I could see how our mothers and the community were not having access to potable water, to clean water. The shelter, the structures were, were broken down and there was ex exclusivity in terms of how services were being provisioned and seeing how women on a daily basis would go to nearby forests to collect firewood to come back. Today, 30 years after that, I'm still hearing the conversations about the need to provision uh, nat uh, natural resources, whether it's affordable energy, whether it's clean water, whether it's affordable health uh, to, to people. And now we are faced by double challenges, not only of climate change, but the COVID the challenge. And for me, that becomes a very central thing to understand that in order to place 
gender issues or women issues at the center, it requires structural transformation. So when I joined the UN, I people see the first thing I wanted to understand is how are we addressing women? How are we addressing gender issues? How are we ensuring that the action plans and merge out of these processes truly and fundamentally contribute to real transformation? And therefore, uh, with the gender equity movement together with you and women, how do we put women at the center? How do we ensure that not only can they equally participate in decision making in the negotiations and transforming the content of negotiation to address those socioeconomic uh, issues, that, but fundamentally that the outcome of this kind of processes we're here or participating really translate to transformation of the ground, that bare land, like the most we're seeing at the Sahara Forest Project demonstrated there, really is transformed that when you drop off a lady at the roadside of our degraded land, and you see them going into the Assal region, that they end up somewhere where they can transform their land into producing food for their communities. And for me, that's fundamentally my passion and the reason I work in this international processes to create those platforms. And I was just mentioning, I had a chance really for the first time to be at the front line of receiving the world leaders. And I spoke to Biden and I said, Biden, we are excited that the US is back on, on this topic. And we are looking at my political said, what are you telling him? I said, yes, I told him, we not only need your voice, but we need your voice to speak for the vulnerable people, but also to unlock the not only $100 billion, but we need capacity, we need technology, we need conversations and open, inclusive uh, conversations so that women all over the world can express and be part and parcel of the solutions, including nature-based solutions to address the climate change challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. Uh, here at the Pavilion, we have the pleasure and privilege of co collaborating with the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and uh, representing the Norwegian government here today, we have Mr. Steve Jovic, longtime diplomat from, from Norway. Now he's currently the director of uh, climate and environment at uh, NURAT. And uh, Steve, when listening to the other panelists here and knowing that Norway is a champion for gender equity, what are your, your thoughts on, on, on the topic today? Uh, I think it's interesting. Let me, let me just sort of uh, look a little bit at the big picture uh, first. I think as was pointed out by, by several previous panelists, nature is, is back. Yeah? I think that's one very important aspect. If you look at earlier cops, very often you, you would have the impression that, yeah, it's a small part somewhere, but it's not really part of the core of what we, what we do. That is, uh, that is back. I think people are somehow back more as well, and especially in indigenous peoples have come back in all of the big meetings this year, much better that they're organized and, and clearly asking to be, be heard. Also indigenous women have been very, very leading some of these, uh, these processes. So that is, that is one important uh, thing. I think Dan, Dan said something important, yeah, that working holistic is difficult. But why is it so difficult? I think often it's difficult because you first decide what you want to do and then you think, okay, and I have to think of women. Oh, and I have to think of nature. Or well, I have to think of this and that. Then it becomes, becomes difficult. But I think the trick for us as a development agency is to see where do these things meet? Where does climate meet the interests of women, meet the interests of, uh, of nature meet? and try to, to focus on some of these issues. Cecilia pointed to the point of going out to, to collect firewood here. Yeah. I think it is baffling that uh, 20, 30 years after we started talking about all the ill effects of health, on nature, on climate, of dirty cooking, so little has happened. Maybe, maybe uh, the issue is not sexy enough. But we, we, we think that this is really an issue that needs to be visited because cutting down trees to burn them in general is an extremely bad idea. And especially if it kill people at the, at the same time. So I, I think to a large extent it's about how do you think when you define programs. I think your project is a hard work, a wonderful uh, 
example of the same, yeah? trying to think holistic, then design, then build, not the other way. Around. Excellent. Um, final speaker, Hayden. Physically in the panel is, is Frederick Hauge. We are also bringing in uh, Ruba Al-Subi, our, our uh, country director of, from the Jordan office uh, here on video, finally, after Frederick has uh, spoken. But uh, Frederick, for those of you who don't know you very well, you are you founded Bologna back in 1986. You were 20 years old. You're one of uh, Norway, Norway's most famous environmentalists. You have been in the game for a long time. You went to Rio in, in 1992. Uh, and now you're here. Um, can you please uh, elaborate a bit, Frederick, uh, on your journey as an environmentalist? How do you see uh, the gender issue in uh, this, when it comes to actually uh, both the, the challenges of, of climate change, but also when it comes to the solutions? Thank you, Magnus. Um, first of all, it's a privilege to have the past founder here. We have been working with uh, Louis Pong for kind of nine years. Uh, she's from there, but you're here. Also, you mentioned Mambari Montai, and we had her at her conference in 2008 in Norway. It was very inspiring. And I remember when she was in Copenhagen, I was sitting together with her. I think she maybe had birthday that evening. And okay, then we had to fix it. So, what we see. And we see that in our work in Russia, we see it in Middle East, in Africa, everywhere. It's the women who is mostly affected about their environmental consequences. They are the people who are standing above the cook stove and get cancer. They are the people that have to travel longer when the fresh water well becomes salty. They are the people with the knowledge, especially within agriculture. In Sahara Forest Project, we try to have this holistic approach where we make use of what we have too much of, that's CO2, sand and desert, and seawater to produce what we need more of, which is fresh uh, uh, salt water, as I said, but we need fresh water and we produce sand. We produce food, we produce biomass, and we do rehabilitation. Uh, when we should learn about agriculture in, in Jordan, we have to go to the woman. Because we didn't want to introduce new species, new ways. We wanted to build this on the tradition locally in this country. And we have to travel around to the different groups doing farming and learn from the women. Then we started to be technical, we started to build the facilities. And of course, that's just bad doing that. Yeah? So that was not good. Uh, that was not completely good. Then we started now an education program to bring, uh, I want to say, extremely well-educated, uh, while they were uh, girls and women into the facility. And um, it's one of the most inspiring things I've done, because we can build this thing in Jordan, but if you don't take this up as an example that could create precedence, and if it's not uh, an example that could be largely deployed. We should do something else. If we are going to be able to deploy, we need to use our facilities in Jordan to educate people so they can educate other people again when they are scaled up. Uh, what we see is that this, even if they have a good education, it's difficult to get a job after the education because they have no access. After been working with uh, us in half a year, most of them really get a good job. And I, I find that so inspiring. But even more inspiring is the creativity that comes out from this education program and how this are improving our technology and our ways of doing it. And for me, this shows that in Africa now we have a uh, extremely huge problem with fresh water wells that we drilled earlier, that salt the air. And who is going to go the extra mile to get the water? We know who it is, yeah? And, and by using our technology, I hope that we also can solve this problem and make fresh water of all these contaminated wells that, that after some years starts to become salty. 
that I hope that the education program we do in Jordan really will be the teachers all over the East and Africa and teach up all the older people. And I would say uh, to do this is the only way to solve the problem because we get an absolutely different commitment and much more new ideas than we, we work with, with men in the facility. So it's inspiring. It's a to talk about what I see with the one of the consequences on women in, in Russia and uh, all other places also. But Sahara Forest Project is, is a project where seeing is believing. Um, an example that the uh, presidents in the last two years we really have learned that we need women to operate this. It's much better than we do it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fredrik. Uh, now we're going to hear a, a brief video message from, from the Sahara Forest Project representative in, in Amman. So, Frederick, if I may ask you to sit there for that and also make the other panelists uh, so that you can actually watch the screen here. Yeah, if you can sit there. Uh, and uh, our good friend Benjamin will, will now, it's, it's a brief video message from, from Ruba, and then we'll also see the facility that we'll be talking about only as a concrete example of, of the topic here, here today. So, so Benjamin, please. Distinguished speakers and dear global citizens, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sending you green and warm regards from the Hashman Kingdom of Jordan. Jordan is far from being a contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, yet, it's losing its natural and fixed assets owing to climate change. Climate change is and will affect us in the most vulnerable places. In my home country, we have the highest engineers per capita in the world. We have an engineer for every 40 people, of which over 26% are females. In Jordan, females enrolled in universities are far more than men. Despite these numbers, female participation in the labor market is still below 15%. In 2021, unemployment rates in Jordan reached 25%. The female share of that was 33%. Despite all of this, women are transformers and change makers. They challenge themselves before challenging their external limitations. I'm proud to be one of many Jordanian female engineers who are driven by passion, global citizenship, and local responsibility and want to make an impact. Allow me to, sh to share briefly a concrete example that I'm proudly involved in. The upskilling program in agri-tech and food security implemented in partnership between the Sahara Forest Project and the Hussein Technical University in Jordan. In its initial stage, the program uh, targeted 30 females uh, from all over Jordan with skills that are acquired by the labor market. Seeing these female graduates embarking into the green tech market, whether as employees or entrepreneurs, forms a real opportunity that we are committed to leverage and anchor with our partner, PhD. Dear global citizens, empowering educated and passionate females to lead climate action demands new and innovative approaches across localities, specializations, and sectors. We need you all to join us in enabling equal and inclusive climate action. Thank you. Shukran. A short film uh, of what Ruba has been talking about uh, one, one and a half minutes. We've just recently had a visit from the HTU University with a number of students from different universities. The ladies have come onto the farm to experience the practical side of farming. Uh, 
كيف نطور في بلدنا اكثر؟ في جانب الاخر عم بعطينا اجريكلتشر بعلم متطور وبعلم جديد. فالمختلف في هذا البروجكت هو اللي ميزه هو اللي خلانا احنا نتميز ونحاول دائما انه تكون نظرتنا للاعلى، في بيت كل حدا فينا لازم يكون حدا عنده خبره بثلاث اشياء، في الطاقه، في الاجريكلتشر وفي التنميه، لانه هذول الثلاث اشياء هم المقيمين، هلا مع الازمه الاخيره صرنا نعرف قيمه الاجريكلتشر وصرنا نعرف قيمه انه فعليا بيتنا لازم يكون فيها لازم تكون خضراء يعني لازم يكون لنا مزروعات ببيتنا علشان انفسنا وعلشان صحه بلدنا بشكل كامل. The Sahara Forest Project uses sun, sea and wind as energy sources. We use a So here, uh, we, we cut it short here, um, due to time. It's, it's a longer film, happy to share if, if anyone wants to see the whole thing. But I really want, on behalf of the Bologna Foundation, on behalf of the Sahara Forest Project, Project Foundation, to thank Pathfinder International for realizing this uh, event here today. I want to thank also the Norwegian government for, for your support in, in our work, both here in Glasgow, but also in Jordan, of course. And thanks, Mrs. Ilya, also for your time. We really appreciate it. And thank you for the audience, both here in Glasgow and following online. Uh, and I wish you a good day forward. Thanks.